Good afternoon, colleagues. We are going to continue and have the last, um, the last presentation from our partner highlights, and that is professionalizing and institutionalizing academic advising for student success, and that will be from our colleagues at University of KwaZulu-Natal. I hated that I may be, we may be uh, between you and something much more exciting. <laughs> I am honored um, on behalf of UKZN to speak with my colleagues about professionalizing and institutionalizing academic advising for student success. This is a project that we aim to entrench in the entire academy at UKZN. I'm just going to present a few of the opening slides and then my colleagues uh, will take over from me. Can we have the next slide, please? My apology for what appears to be a very busy slide. Um, I wanted, we wanted to contextualize it, our presentation, this business of academic advising. In the entire uh, student value chain from transitioning into a higher education, uh, to exiting from higher education and bring the two to the all, all three of them together. Hence, we uh, included both the world of pre uh, uh, um, university and the world of work. This uh, uh, approach. Uh, we are, I'm hoping that uh, we will use to rationalize why uh, we want to touch everybody in the academy. So we look at the student entry attributes qualitatively and quantitatively uh, within the context of a, a very highly varied uh, extent of research. We also look at the recruitment uh, to determine access and also we uh, and couple that with the student experience to achieve the successes and we want to improve the successes. So we uh, blend into that project all that uh, the student uh, must go through together with the entire environment of the uh, academy, as you will see later on. Obviously, the curriculum is at the center of this, but the curriculum alone will not be able to do it. Remembering that we want to touch roughly uh, 40 to 50,000 students, and we want to touch uh, four to five thousand staff, not only academic staff, um, including undergraduate and postgraduate. Bear in mind that uh, these days we don't want to be preparing students only for employability, we also want to be preparing students for entrepreneurship and creation of own life. Let's can we get the next slide, please. So let me touch on a few highlights and rush through this briefly of what um, has happened. The professionalization of the academic advising 
at UKZN has made some strides, really. Um, we, for example, we've established academic advising uh, units in each college. Uh, perhaps I should point out that the UKZN uh, is structured in a college model, four colleges with 19 schools uh, among the four colleges. And within those schools, there are disciplines. We have uh, embarked on a, an ambitious instructional design project and we have established instructional designers which we deployed in the colleges. Uh, we have an assessment a support group, first year experience, and we uh, also have um, a, collaborate, a collaboration with the University of Johannesburg for student uh, epistemic success and success. Uh, I don't want to go through the, all of this uh, because I'm aware that today uh, uh, in, in my language, the country in Japan, the dog ate the time. <laughs> <laughs> we have had some recent initiatives to enhance access and success. Um, scholarship of teaching and learning, uh, uh, communities of practice. This is growing quite nicely and it's a nest project. Academic integrity project, digital transformation project, it is linked to the uh, instructional designers project. Uh, the online courses for academic monitoring and support of tutors and also the community engagement. Next slide, please. Please allow me to spend a, little, uh, a, a few minutes on this. Uh, academic advising advisory group has been established and this is being institutionalized. Uh, bear in mind what I said earlier, everything has, has, has to have four tentacles from the center into the four colleges. Uh, establishing the um, academic advising unit in each college within the portfolio of, of the deans of teaching and learning. Each college has a college dean of teaching and learning, so there are four of them, one in each college, and each college has a college dean of research, and there are four of them. And so each of the champions of the AA College Deans of Teaching. Team of advising at scale. And to this, there are, if you like, two dimensions. So advising at scale, of course, means advising large numbers of students on the order of 40,000 students. And being able to connect with all 40,000 students, of course, is quite resource intensive. And to achieve that, the intention is to blend the automation with the human advising. And of course, you need the human advising to ameliorate some of the, uh, some of the things you want to say. You can't entirely rely on automation uh, to do it, but that's the aspect of advising at scale. <coughs> then also advising includes advising the different role players in higher education. So of course, uh, there's the lecturer that we typically think of in advising, but then we find also the lecturers require advising, and that means advising to the lecturer. Then also the program managers, the, the people who convene the programs, the heads of department and the deans. Of course, also the student advisors themselves and the support. They need the data about the students to some extent and then, of course, uh, the DVCs and executive as well. So each of these scales require different types of advising. And of course, a starting point is simple awareness of the data, knowing the graduation rates and uh, the number of students graduating in minimum time, as we saw earlier, and so on. But going beyond awareness, we also want to connect the awareness with specific actions that can be taken and also to commit to doing this long term, knowing that the improvements that come are often quite incremental and they take a long time to accumulate and it's a matter more of boiling the frog than discreetly jumping to a, a new state. 
So this shows some of the projects at play uh, that Prof. Sonka has mentioned and uh, that are specifically working through the CFO Malela group. And when we first put those forward, of course, this number of 10 different projects, uh, we were accused of being uh, ambitious there, and Ashton just looked up because uh, he accused us. Uh, but uh, uh, we found that we could uh, embed all these projects in this broader theme of advising at scale, and we look at different, uh, different aspects of that. So on the first aspect, looking at our whole institution advising or executive scale advising, starting off with those basic numbers that, yes, there's a certain number coming into the first year, so what proportion are graduating in minimum time, what proportion is never graduating at all. And knowing these numbers, the next question is, where is that happening? So from which programs are we losing the larger number of students? Because those averages are not representative of every program. There's a lot of variance across the institution. So on the right, you can't really see that, but we can create a ranked list of all the programs at the institution and the different performance metrics, and then be able to prioritize which programs require the, the uh, or to use Sue Pata's uh, phrasing earlier, uh, which are the high priority programs to begin with. <laughs> and we can see there, uh, by selecting the program, it starts to populate with more information towards that. And then some of the actions you can take around that, once you know which programs uh, to prioritize, then to look at directing more resources that way, also starting to look at it more strategically, so looking at the career opportunities and one of the projects, the Graduate Attributes Project, uh, that looks at the alignment uh, with the national priorities. So it's not simply a matter of improving the pass rate across the board, it's, it's also uh, looking at the national objectives as well. Then looking at the next scale, once we've identified these are the programs that need more support, then it goes to the next scale in the academic programs, in the faculties and so on. So now that these heads of department and deans have these extra resources, are they identifying uh, the, uh, the actions? So looking at the more detailed budget expenditure, looking at allocation of teaching, uh, you know, the teaching programs and teaching budgets, looking at the different forms of support. And it's incredible the amount of support that, uh, the, the number of support programs, sometimes it's hard to keep track of all the support programs, and being able to spend judiciously and in, in the support programs that have the greatest impact. So, uh, and this is not a COVID slide, uh, the, the part on the right is, is showing uh, the, the different combinations of courses. So part of the program work is also understanding our students, looking at the different course combinations by which they are progressing through our academic programs. And it's quite amazing, sometimes you have, it feels as many ways to graduate as there are students uh, registered in the programs. And some of the work involved here, uh, there's the uh, student support and engagement project where they are developing an automated system for students to connect with the, with the support as mentioned. There's also uh, couple things you can do there. So for instance, if we understand there's a progression route which may, might involve an extra year of study, that it might be possible to support student over crediting to get back onto minimum time to grad if we just timetable differently. So these are some of the simple things that we can do once we understand these different routes to graduation. And this is just a shot showing how easy it is to create these concept scaffolds. So this is starting to go towards the, uh, down to the module level now. So we've gone from whole institution to academic program, then going into the modules. Can we identify the coursework? Can we identify the different components and uh, compose the concept scaffold? Because once you have this, the rich data of the concept scaffold, all kinds of new teaching and learning possibilities uh, become open. And uh, in this interface, it's possible within just, say, two minutes to create a detailed concept scaffold showing uh, how things progress from the more fundamental levels to, to the more applied levels 
and how the various concepts connect to each other, and also to cross-connect those. So, cro uh, so connecting these maps across modules starts to show us how the ideas flow uh, right from the first year to the exit point. So starting to break down those silos that tend to form around our coursework. So further to lecturer advising, uh, being able to, uh, to automatically declare to the lecturer, we think these students are at risk. Is it possible to reach out to these students? Also monitoring in these modules, are these specific actions taken towards organizing the content better? And you can see a list of six things that the lecturer can do there. So again, being able to connect the data with the specific actions that can be taken to improve the performance. So uh, some of the applications of the earlier concept, scaffold for instance, include that when teaching a new topic, uh, one could point out the map to the students and say, we are approaching this new topic. You see these are the prerequisite concepts or the more fundamental concepts that need to be understood or revised. And then, given that we are currently studying this topic, you can see how it's going to link to all these other uh, later topics. So, uh, so that's the relevance of the, the current work. Uh, there's also automation in terms of advising all the students, so being able to generate uh, all the, the data from all the assessments. So in the current semester, identifying which students are at risk, and then being able to advise all of them in uh, basically with the click of a button. So uh, first, the, the lecturer can customize a script and decide among the categories of students what types of messages to distribute and to uh, progress that way. Uh, also, there's a lot of work in terms of creating the learning content around this. So in terms of the, the learning content, uh, leveraging the web technology that's available, uh, to integrate things like uh, animations and, uh, and synthesized voice. Uh, all these things are possible uh, on the order of kilobytes. Uh, so, uh, Also automated questions, uh, so for us to monitor whether the students are uh, grasping the core concepts. Uh, so we can automate the, and I'm just going to skip forward to one of the, um, so on this interface, it shows a student that uh, is getting advice about their current status. It's saying, I see you are on track to graduate uh, with this class of degree. Did you know by improving by just a fraction of a percent, you can improve, improve to a higher class of degree? And looking at the courses you are currently registered for, looking at the assessment data, uh, you can improve uh, by taking these specific actions. And it presents the student with learning content to improve uh, that kind of performance. Uh, there's also uh, gamification and uh, students accumulating badges and leaderboards and so accumulating these into their uh, curriculum vitae uh, so that when they apply for uh, scholarships and jobs and so on that they have this kind of credit uh, available to them. Um, so uh, also looking at students as co-creators in this process, uh, releasing uh, editors to, uh, to make it possible for students also to use uh, these resources to create uh, learning resources as well. Okay, and I think that chair screen means uh, my, my time is up there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, UKZ. And we have three minutes. Three minutes for questions. Anybody with a question or a comment? <coughs> what do you hear from a I was also waiting for one. <laughs> there isn't one here. We do have some. But they don't have a student in this panel.
Thank you. There was at the top career counseling, career guidance, um, career mapping. Do you do that with all your students, or is it just because it was on the slide? So as Prof. Sankar mentioned, the next step will be uh, to institutionalize at a broader scale. That's where people who are not necessarily prepared for that, uh, that's where uh, yeah, the, the hard questions <coughs> will need to be asked uh, more closely. Another question. That will be the last one. Thank you. Last but not least. <laughs> Okay, I just see the question she raised today. I just want to know, are the lecturers implementing? So, uh, so I mentioned that we've started with the pilot studies and we have results from students who have engaged with the content that has been created from what was shown there. We found students, uh, actually many more students engaged than uh, that we asked for, and uh, we asked for, for instance, in one case we've asked for engagement with three instances of a question and we found students with 50 such instances, and we also received uh, a request from a class rep to increase the number of uh, such questions and such content. Uh, so we have some early indicators that the students appreciate this kind of content. Okay, thank you. Can you give them a last round of applause? 